So this morning, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Christian government and politics. Like, hey, we haven't been talking about that enough lately, right? <laughs> yeah, I feel like we should have some intro music playing or something, but uh, some drama, because sure, there's a lot of drama going around, right? And this is one of the things that I love about the Word of God. The Word of God even speaks to the craziness that we are all experiencing right now in the impeachment inquiry, in the re-election that's coming up. So what exactly does the Word of God have to say to you and I, the Christian, about what we should be thinking, saying, how we should be responding to all of the craziness that's going on? I don't know if you saw this, but after, you know, the, uh, after they voted for no witnesses in the impeachment trial in the Senate, um, Mr. Cuomo here says, you should be mad as hell and send a message that you're not going to take it anymore. Well, that's what we all, all that we need, right? Some more rhetoric just to amp up the division and the conflict between us. Uh, that's really not helping anything at all. But uh, I saw another article on CNN. I tried to find it real quick, but I, I couldn't. I wanted to clip that headline out for you. But the, the headline was this, is it time to give up on America? You know, have we gone too far? Is the breach, is the divide too great to heal this nation? Because uh, a nation divided will not stand. That's all there is to it. And we're quickly going down that path. So what should we as Christians be thinking in the midst of all this turmoil? Number one in your notes. I just wanted to remind you from James chapter 3 that the Christian refuses to be drawn into strife. And there's going to be a lot of strife, a lot of barbs, a lot of words going back and forth. Hopefully it won't escalate into some sort of physical conflict, but who knows what might happen here. But as Christians, we cannot be drawn into the strife of it. We can have our belief, we can exercise our faith, we can even exercise our rights of citizenship. But the strife in the heart is something that we have to stay free from. Here in James chapter 3, verse 13, he says this, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct... Now remember, we've been talking lately out of Hosea. What does the Lord require of you? but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. This good conduct is just doing what's right. Even though people don't like it, even though people disagree with you, even though people might persecute you even, no matter what's going on, don't get caught up in the emotion and in the drama of it all. Just do what's right. And you will be a standout, trust me. When everybody else is being driven by this craziness, someone that will just patiently, quietly, gently do what's right will be very notable in this culture. By his good conduct, let him show his works in what? The meekness of wisdom. Now, you know, why is wisdom meek? Why do you see that parallel always in the scriptures? It always speaks of wisdom being meek and gentle. You want to know why? I put it there at the bottom. True wisdom never has to flaunt itself, and it never has to prove that it's right. All of this anger and conflict and commotion and noise and confusion comes from people on opposite ends trying to prove who's right and who's wrong. And that's where all the conflict... Wisdom doesn't have to prove anything. Wisdom is the truth. Wisdom is right. And if you're making decisions and if you're basing your beliefs on what is true in the Word of God, then you don't have to strive with anybody. You're at peace. And therefore, you can deal with situations and you can deal with people in a gentleness, in a meekness. Watch what else he says as we go on here. He says in verse 14, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts... What is this selfish ambition? This selfish ambition is, I've got to prove that I'm right and you're wrong. I'm right, you're wrong. I'm right, 
you're wrong. Do you get that? And we're willing to do anything. But when we're just wanting truth, all of that striving goes away. And you know, when, when, when I want truth more than I want to be right, I'm actually willing to listen to you. I'm actually willing to hear someone that differs with my opinion. Because after all, we're all after truth, right? It's not about who's right or who's wrong. That selfish ambition, the bitter jealousy comes in, all of that commotion comes in when personal ego is involved. I, when I think of this, I can't help but think, I don't know if you all watch Fox News at all or CNN. I try to watch a little bit of all of it to get a flavor so this, this one newscaster, I won't mention his name, but this one newscaster on Fox News was talking about, he was interviewing someone regarding the Second Amendment rights, the right to carry firearms. And so this newscaster on Fox obviously was pro-gun, and I agreed with everything he had to say. But I was so disgusted with how he handled this interview because this interview, he had someone with an opposing view, obviously uh, a liberal, a, a political liberal, who was uh, very much in favor of gun control and the guns being taken away. And so they were going at it, but it was so one-sided. The guy that was in opposition, that wanted gun control, you know, this, this newscaster would ask him a question, well, can you explain to me? And so, you know, the opposition would try to speak. He'd get three, four, maybe six sentences out of his mouth, and the Fox newscaster would just talk right over top of him. He would elevate the level and the tone and the volume of his voice and talk right over top of the guy. And to me, it was disgusting. That, the, the guy that was there in opposition to guns, he didn't get one complete sentence out. And so the whole thing came across as very confusing. The, new, the Fox newscaster was not interested in a constructive discussion. Frankly, all he cared about was proving that this guy was wrong and he was publicly shaming him, publicly embarrassing him in front of this audience. That's not the way you handle situations. That's not, that's not the, the peaceableness, that's not the gentleness of wisdom. And he says here, if you have that kind of bitter jealousy, and so now it's a personal rivalry, I've got to beat you and prove that you're wrong, he said, don't boast about it. Don't be false to the truth. This is not wisdom that comes down from above, but it's what? Earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. And so you have people, again, I agreed in principle with this newscaster, but I really hated his methodology. And you have this in the church today, don't you? The way that some churches uh, condemn homosexuals, and don't get me wrong, homosexuality, is sin. It's an abomination to God. But the venom and the hatred towards the homosexual that comes out of people's mouths in pulpits is inexcusable. It's not the wisdom of God. And this type of thing of, I'm superior and I'm going to condemn you, and I'm superior and I'm going to prove that you're wrong, even if you're saying something that is right, it's earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. It's filled with strife, contention, rivalry, angry ambition, and it's wrong. And it grieves the Spirit of God. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, well, you know, this is a man of God. This is the church. There's no jealousy or ambition in the church. <laughs> Wake up, where have you been? Did not even Jesus' disciples fight among themselves who was the greatest? 
where jealousy and selfish ambi ambition exist, there will be disorder. Is there disorder in our nation right now or what? And you as a Christian cannot be sucked into it. It will produce strife and bitterness in your heart and it will tear you down inside. Don't let it enter in. We know what we believe. We know what's right and wrong based upon the Word of God. We do need to contend for the faith. But as we contend for the faith, we can never be contentious. Because where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. Because it's no longer about the truth. Now it's about me being right. And I'll lie, cheat, manipulate, do anything just to be right. And we see that happening in our nation on both sides, Republican and Democrats. But the wisdom from above is first what? It's pure, meaning that it's void of any human desire or emotion. It's free from jealousy and rivalry. It truly wants the truth. It's not about me winning the argument. It's about arriving at truth. And because it's pure in that way, it's what? It's peaceable. It's gentle. Now, I'm, you know, I'm all for being demonstrative, and I'm all for being yourself. But some preachers think the louder they shout, the more conviction will fall down out of heaven. And it doesn't work that way. You can be convicted by the whisper of God. And it doesn't, mean, it doesn't matter how much you shout or foam at the mouth, it's not necessarily God on the move. Because the wisdom from above, it's peaceable, it's gentle, it's open to reason. You're willing to listen like this Fox newscaster was not. You're willing to let the person complete their sentences, complete their thought. It's full of mercy and good fruits. It's impartial. And again, it's impartial because the focus and the object is truth. It's not personalities. And it's sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. There's a very important principle in that verse. If what you are sowing is not sown in peace, then you're not going to get any righteousness out of it. Let me say it again. If what you are sowing is not sown in peace and in the gentle wisdom of the Lord, you're not going to get any righteousness. Oh, you might stir up a fight. Now, the thing that I'm not saying is that everybody's always going to agree with you. Those bullet points in your notes below that, I put, as Christians, we must never speak, act, or live from a heart or motive of strife. Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, let nothing be done through vain conceit and selfish ambition. Let nothing. Yeah, but they're wrong. Let nothing be done in a spirit of rivalry or selfish ambition or vain conceit? Yeah, but we got to stop them. Let nothing be done through rivalry or vain conceit. We don't, as Christians, we don't fight with people. We bring them the word. If they don't want to hear it, we shake the dust off our feet and we go find someone else. It's just that simple. Secondly, we must contend for the truth without being contentious. It's hard, you know, when you're in a room full of people that are disagreeing and arguing with each other, it's hard to be the objective voice of reason. Because when emotions get involved and drama gets involved, and oh my gosh, it's a real mess, right? 
To speak the truth in strife, ambitious rivalry or anger displeases God. It grieves His Spirit. And then lastly, when speaking for truth and justice, there can be strife that results. Just make sure the contention is for the truth and not for something you've done or said or demonstrated in your attitude. If there's a fight that arises... Will you, be walk, will you be able to walk away knowing that the fight was over truth? That you did your absolute best to present the wisdom of God fairly, in justice, and peaceably. When you speak the truth peaceably, that means you're speaking the truth seeking peace. Trying to bring resolution to the issue by the truth answering all matters. It doesn't have to be my way. The resolution doesn't have to be my answer. I just want the truth to resolve this. And when that's your heart, it can work out. Look at Psalms 34, 14. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Hebrews 12, 14. Strive for peace with who? It didn't say strive for peace with those who agree with you. That would be an easy one, right? What makes this challenging is that not everybody agrees with you. Look at verse 18. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live what? Peaceably with all. And notice that that one phrase, the qualifier as far as it depends on you. Not all things are going to turn out well. Not all relationships go back together. You can speak the truth in love, in gentleness, and a fight still starts. But as far as you are concerned, have you done everything to present the truth peaceably? Speaking the truth in love, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15 says. And this is really key. Here, you know, uh, the Apostle Paul is talking to Timothy and the two epistles to Timothy. This is Timothy, uh, and this is Paul sharing with Timothy how you, are to, uh, how you are to be a pastor, how you are to be a leader. And look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. The Lord's servant must not be what? Quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. Even the people that disagree with me, especially to them. Even the people who want to start a fight, especially to them. Do what's right in the situation. So we're not in this to quarrel. We're not in this to stir up more strife and more contention. We're not here trying to to prove that I'm right and you're wrong. We're here having this discussion to come to truth, and we're going to let truth resolve it. And if there's something I need to change, because truth has now come into the equation, I will change. And I'm hoping you will change too. But you've got to take it out of the realm of personal aggression, personal ambition, personal ego. Because the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. We don't compromise the truth. We don't stand down when justice is being violated. But there's a way that we do it. And the way that we do it is we're kind to everyone. We're able to teach. We're able to communicate why we believe what we believe. We we have the scriptural, biblical foundation. This is right and this is wrong because this is what God says. And we're able to bring truth into the discussion. And in these situations, we are even patient in enduring evil. Because sometimes you're going to have to endure evil. Can you endure the evil patiently or are you going to strike back? Can you endure the evil patiently? Or is that other person going to push all of your buttons and make you really mad? 
And look at this. We are to correct our opponents with what? With gentleness. When someone's ranting and raving and getting up in your grill and just really fiery mad, let's face it, that's the last kind of a person you want to acknowledge. But when someone is truly gentle and speaking the truth, their attitude, their tone of voice, their demeanor makes it really, really hard for you to continue fighting. Isn't it frustrating when you want to fight and the other party doesn't want to fight? That's what he's talking about here. You're, you're heaping coals of fire on their head. So the Christian, you know, in this political strife that we are all exposed to right now, number one, the, the Christian refuses to be drawn into it. Secondly, the Christian is very cautious about passing judgment. One thing is for sure, and if you are unsure about this, go home, watch CNN for 30 minutes, watch Fox for 30 minutes, and you'll walk away knowing. I mean, the, the stories are so wide apart, someone's not giving us all the facts. Someone's not telling the truth. And you know where the truth lies? It always lies in the middle, doesn't it? If one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. The one who states his case first seems right until the other guy comes along, right? Because, you know, we, we conveniently just kind of leave out of the story everything that we did. And we conveniently leave out all of the things that we did that prompted this fight. And so then we hear the other side of the story and we say, oh, that changes things a little bit. Just remember, the truth usually lies somewhere in the middle. Don't be quick and hasty to pass judgment. James 1.19, know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak. I know in times I've been quick to speak. And it's been because of my own impulse. And you end up embarrassed. And you end up realizing... I shouldn't have spoken too soon. I was foolish to speak too soon. Slow to anger. Because the anger, and get this, remember when we said that whatever you're sowing that's not in peace will not produce any righteousness? Verse 20 is saying that the same thing here. Whatever you do in anger, that angry spirit, that ambitious spirit, the, the thing of I've got to win, that type of disposition does not produce the righteousness of God. Well, I'm right. And you may be right. Well, I'm just saying what the Word says. And it, that may be so. But the strife and the anger of your heart, you're just using the Word of God as a weapon now. And the strife and the anger of your heart is not the righteousness of God. And you're going to turn the other person off. And unfortunately, many people get turned off to the Word of God because people are handling the Word of God unwisely in their own impulses and in their own emotions instead of doing it righteously and gently, as the Bible says. just wanted to show you this one passage from Isaiah 11, verse 1, where it says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. We know he's talking about Jesus. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. The Spirit of counsel and might. The Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. And look at this next line. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or, decides, or decide disputes by what his ears hear. He's just saying, yes, and there's a balance here, yes, we shall know them by their fruit, right? So there's that side of the equation, and then the other side of the equation is you can't always trust what you see and hear. Have any of you ever had someone lie to your face? You can't always trust what you see and hear. But see, the Lord's judgment is always perfect because He knows the heart. He knows the motive. He knows what's true or false. 
And he's going to bring righteous judgment where you and I many times are unable to. And so I'm just bringing this up. Number one, as a Christian, don't get caught up in the strife of everything that's happening politically. But secondly, realize this. You're not getting the straight story from the media. We don't know everything. We can see and hear, and yes, we have opinions, and there's nothing wrong with having those opinions. But just, just always be slow to speak and quick to hear and realize, I can't, I'm not the judge. This needs to be left with the righteous judge who knows all, who can see the hearts and the motives. And for people like me, I better just zip my lips and let God take care of this. That's the safest way to proceed. Thirdly, realize this. Personally, I believe we live in the greatest nation on earth. I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. But human government, no matter how good, is always corrupt. And it's always corrupt because of men's heart. And I know a lot of conservative evangelical Christians do not believe that you can be a Democrat and a Christian at the same time, and the Republicans are the good guys, and the Democrats are the bad guys, and it's us against them. And I know, you know, that's, that's very easy to fall into, but I just want you to know there's just as much corruption in the Republican Party as there is in the Democratic Party. We all have our dirt, don't we? And the Lord was really concerned here in 1 Samuel chapter 8 because up till this time in the history of Israel, they had never had a king. They had always been uh, ruled over by judges. And so here in 1 Samuel 8 verse 6, it says, But the thing displeased Samuel the prophet when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. The Lord wanted to be their king. The Lord wanted to give them his laws. And he did through Moses. Now watch what happens. Samuel's going to warn the people. So you really want a man to rule over you? whether it be king or president or whatever you call him. And he's trying to warn them. I mean, he's saying, so this is what's going to happen when you have a man rule over you instead of the Lord. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king. And he said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons. And every place in this passage where the word take is used, I put it in all caps so that you can kind of count as we go. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. So therefore... You're not living to serve the Lord or to provide for your family. You're living and working for this man who you wanted to have as your king. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. Take what you worked hard to produce and give it to his officers. He will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. This donkey belonged to you, but your donkey is now carrying this other man's load, not your load. He will take the tenth of your flocks, and you shall be his slaves. What is he saying, and what's the point of us reading this? You cannot rise to these 
pa- these positions of power and authority without it affecting you. And we know the saying, the quote, don't we? Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts. Ab- absolutely. You know how we always, you know, how we always tease people, you know, when you get rich and famous, you know, you remember us poor folks, won't you? And they say, oh, yes, we'll never forget where we came from. It changes you. It affects you. Prosperity is a dangerous trap for your soul. That's why the wise man prayed, Lord, keep me poor enough so that I always need you, so that I'm always seeking you, but make me prosperous enough so that I'm not tempted to covet or steal from my brother, my neighbor. That is a very wise balance, isn't it? (laughs) So if you're financially, if you're kind of like living on the edge right now, you're probably in the best place you can be. Because money is very corrupting. Power, authority is very corrupting. Because you can control things. And I don't need God anymore because look what I can do with my slaves, with my servants, with my money. I can make things happen. Who needs God? And that is a warning that God gives time and time again throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament. And so he's emphasizing here, and and remember what he told the prophet to do. He says in verse 18, in that day you will cry out because of this king that you wanted. Because he's oppressive. Because he's taking from you and making it his own. But you've chosen this. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, no. We want to be like the other nations. We want to have a king over us. So that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And we could get really lost in the weeds with that, but I don't want to. Remember that passage we just read out of Isaiah 11? Watch what happens when Jesus comes to the throne. There's a day coming. It's called the millennial reign. When he will come with his saints and he will rule the earth. And Satan will be bound in prison. Do you want to see what kind of a world exists when Jesus is the absolute king? In Isaiah 11, verse 1, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, and the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He won't judge by what he sees or hears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor. With that righteousness he will decide For the meek of the earth, he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. That's why we've been saying, you better get right with Jesus today because there's a day coming when it's going to be too late. Judgment is coming. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day you need to answer his call. Because Jesus, we are in the dispensation of grace, and Jesus is calling to you today. But there's coming a day when judgment comes, and you won't be able to call upon him anymore. There's coming a day when he shall kill the wicked. Now watch what happens when Jesus is king. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, faithfulness the belt of his loins, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the lion and the fatted calf together. A little child shall lead them. No violence, no pain, no sickness, no more abuse, no more wars, no more fighting. When Jesus is king, And there ain't no one that will ever impeach him. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. 
And the nursing child shall play over the whole of the cobra. <laughs> that's, a, that's a scary thought. But not there it won't be. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all of my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of God. Because that's what it's like when Jesus is king. The earth shall be full of the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. And so it kind of helps to set our expectation when we're kind, trying to process everything that's happening in our nation and in our government. Realize that even with the best of governments, there will always be corruption until Jesus comes and assume lordship, absolute lordship. And so lastly, I leave you with this thought. Christians obey the government until they cannot. We are a peaceful people. We are a submissive people. We don't try to stir up revolutions or fights or riots. Romans chapter 13, verse 1, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur what? Judgment. Why do we have secular law enforcement? Why do we have a court system? Why do we have a justice department? Why do we have armies and navies? Why does all of this exist? It exists because of the sinfulness of man. And God has appointed those authorities. I, I put this in the note that I skipped over quickly. Secular governments, as ordained by God, serve the same purpose as the law of Moses. The law of Moses, it was impossible for the law to remove sin from our hearts. It was impossible for the law to forgive us of our sins. It was impossible for the law to regenerate the heart and change a man but it was never intended to. The purpose of the law was just to restrain sin, not eliminate it, but just restrain it to keep some semblance of order because without the law, without order, there's anarchy. And nobody wins in anarchy. It's just mass destruction and confusion. And so... Why do we have police? Why do we have prisons? Why do we have courts? What, what good is it doing? Well, that's a good question, actually. But why do we have them? You're never going to do away with violence. You're never going to do away with criminals. You're never going to do away with abuse or theft or murder. But the law is valuable and it's ordained by God to restrain to hold the tide of evil back, to give people time to repent. And that's why God has ordained it. And so if you resist these authorities that God has placed in your life, you will incur judgment because God has them here for a purpose. Yeah, but they're just as corrupt as the criminals. Yeah, a lot of them are. Well, how can I trust them to do what's right? Ah, good question. Sometimes you can't. But we can trust God, and we can trust the fact that God has put order in place on this earth for a reason. Rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive approval. He's God's servant for your good. And if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. He's the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. That guy just thinks he's working for the county or for the state or for the federal system. In the bigger picture, what he doesn't see is that he's actually a messenger of God restraining evil on the earth. Therefore, one must be in subjection. He says, because of this, you also pay taxes. We all pay taxes, right? We are contributing citizens. We contribute to the overall good of the community. The authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. 
Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. So as a Christian, we are submissive to the governing authorities knowing that they are ordained by God as long as we can. So when can we no longer submit? Well, I think we all know the answer, right? The apostles and the disciples were being brought before the Sanhedrin in the book of Acts for preaching the name of Jesus. And remember, the Sanhedrin was not just ruling over uh, the synagogues at the time. This was a, this was a public um, communal uh, policing that was being done by the Sanhedrin for society. And they said, we told you guys not to teach in his name. And what did, what did Peter and the apostles say? We must obey God rather than men. So whenever the governing authority contradicts what God has told you to do, and you have to make a choice, the choice is easy, isn't it? We obey God. But we don't obey God and snub the government in some form of riot and anarchy and revolution. We, we're submissive, we're peaceable about what we do. It's not a thing of in your face. It's a thing of, I respect your position, but I cannot obey you in this. And so it's, it's, it's done without the drama, without the emotion, without stirring up more trouble. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? And they were commanded to worship the image. Look at their response. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. <laughs> That's not a good answer to give a king. When the king asks you a question, your response probably shouldn't be, I don't have to give you an answer. But that's what they're saying. And yet they're, they're not trying to be a smart aleck. They're just saying, this is God's business, king. The one who is far greater than you told us to do this. And so we... If it comes to a choice, we're going to obey God rather than man. And we don't have any need to answer you in this matter because, frankly, you don't have jurisdiction over our faith. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. Go ahead, throw us in. He will deliver us. But even if he doesn't, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image. So there is a peaceable, gentle disobedience of I've got to do what my God commands me to do. If you want to put me in jail, put me in jail. If you want to throw me in the fiery furnace, throw me in the fiery furnace. And let God sort it all out. Amen? Remember that passage when Daniel knew that the document had been signed. The law was in place. Anybody that didn't worship the king was to be thrown into the den of lions. When he knew that that had become law, he made it law himself. Daniel, knowing what the king had done and set into motion, went to his house, opened his windows. That may have been a good time to shut the windows, don't you think? But what did he do? He opened the windows. And he started praying. So there is a time. We, but as Christians, we obey the government until we cannot any longer obey. And so I hope that you know, brings some clarity and sorts some things out as far as how do we respond in the crazy times that we're in? I think first and foremost on my heart was that point, don't get caught up in the strife and in the conflict. Uh, it's not worth it. This kind of back and forth of I'm going to prove that you're right, that I'm right and you're wrong and I'm smart and you're stupid and I'm going to be superior to you, that's of the devil. And in that kind of atmosphere, every vile work becomes evident. And we don't want to participate in that. But on the other hand, we are to watch and pray. We're to be aware of what's happening around us.
And we're to be in prayer to be prepared and strengthened to meet whatever is coming. Because something is coming. We know for sure the Lord is coming. And we need to be ready for Him. Father, we thank You for the guidance of Your Word. And we thank You that even times like this, Your Word is a lamp to our feet. We don't have to guess what to do or what not to do. We don't have to wonder what we are to think or how we are to respond. Your Word is very clear. And we're so thankful that we have the Bible to tell us every step of the way, how to respond and what to do and how to live. And we see very clearly in Your Word We cannot let this strife and this confusion and this rivalry into our hearts. We can't be quick to judge, to pass condemnation. We have to be slow to speak, quick to hear, slow to anger. We have to realize that you are sovereign and you are in control and you know a whole lot more than we do so we can leave it safely in your hands. You will give us the illumination of what what our next step is to be and how we are to walk. Father, teach us that meekness of wisdom. Teach us the peaceableness. You said as Christians we are to seek peace. We are to strive to live in peace with everyone so much as it depends upon us. Father, we pray if a fight erupts around us or because of us, We pray that it's nothing we did. We pray that we will always be able to walk away in a clear conscience knowing I represented the truth and it's the truth that they hated. But I didn't provoke them because of my manner or methodology of bringing the truth. Father, teach us your ways. Teach us how to walk in a crooked world that is destitute of truth. We love you and we worship you. We pray that you go with us now and keep us safe. Bring us back tonight to worship you again. In Jesus' name, amen.